Well, Ditlev, welcome to Business Spectator. Thank and you. And welcome to Australia. So wind power has been more difficult, perhaps, or has been difficult in the last few years. Uh, has it been surprising to you uh, how, how hard it's been? And have you had to change your view about where wind would end up as a proportion of electricity um, generation? Um, a lot of questions in what you're asking me here. So maybe we'll just perhaps back, start with whether... Yeah, whether we'll just take one step back to, to, to look at where we were coming from what the world was expecting, what we're seeing now, and what we're looking ahead. So That's kind of what, we're, that's yeah. what I'm asking. Yeah. So if you, if you go back and say, well, back in 2007, 2008, uh, you had drivers where everything had to be green. Uh, we were looking for a big uh, deal at the UN in Copenhagen uh, at the COP15. Uh, you had the price of oil, $140 per barrel. Uh, you had like uh, $10 per MTPU of gas. Uh, you had a carbon price in Europe of 30 uh, euros per ton and so on. So everything was indicating that cost of energy was just going to go through the roof. And that obviously also meant that renewables were seen as being very much more attractive way of also mitigating costs. Then the financial crisis came. And if we just look at the year 2012, what are we left with? In Europe, the price, the price on the ETS has gone from 30 to 4. Uh, the gas prices in the US have gone from 12 to 3. Uh, the economic growth have vanished. Southern Europe is underwater. We have a constrained bank system. Uh, and the talk about uh, climate change uh, and the impact from renewables has basically vanished as well. So in our industry, we're wondering, what are we missing for the perfect storm here? Uh, it's perfect. Uh, it's perfect. So, so I think the really interesting thing is when you ha add up everything that you, in a risk scenario, would say could go wrong, basically in the wind industry has gone wrong. But despite that, nobody has left the industry. And why is that? But you're losing money though, aren't you? Well, we had a very difficult 2012, but everybody had in the industry. But, but we are only in the wind sector, so we're going to stay there. Uh, but a lot of our competitors have other legs to stand on. They're not leaving the industry either. They're saying, well, if you look at the fundamentals on wind, they're very, very strong. So even it's tough at the moment and is not as good as everybody thought it was going to be, then actually the installation of wind uh, is coming to, uh, to really keep on growing. And if you just look in the U.S. in 2012, now I'm in Australia uh, here today, mm -hmm. and when I travel around the world, everybody talks to me about shale gas, shale gas, shale gas. Uh, which, of course, is a new phenomenon and it is part of the, of the, of the energy mix. However, in 2012, when I tell people that in the U.S. they installed more wind than shell uh, than gas of new generation capacity in 2012, because they had a special subsidy, didn't they? But they have, or they still have. Uh, my point is that when, if you in the U.S. have a price of gas around six, then wind is competitive. Now we are down at the three to four level at the moment, and that's why the production tax credit, as you were giving reference to, has been very important. But if you look at the expectations to gas going forward, at this level, I think most people are saying, well, it's going to come up again. And then wind is going to be a very important part of the mix. And the interesting thing is when people look at this is, if you're not going to go down this alley, what are the real options on the table? Are you going to install nuclear? I don't think so. Are you going to install new coal? Very few countries are considering that option. So if you look at what are the real options if you want to replace existing generation capacity, or if you want to add new capacity. And here, wind is actually standing out pretty strong in cost of energy, despite all the, let's say, perfect storm things that we've gone through in the last few years. Are you saying that in Australia, uh, as well as yeah. the US, yeah. um, you can install wind on the basis of a, without subsidy on the basis of a $6 um, gas price? It depends from country to country where, where you are and the total cost of uh, capital, the cost of sites. So, well, but in Australia, if you look into, into Australia, I think it, it's clear that you want to have an energy transformation. And you have to, you, there are two types of countries. There are countries that have, they're short of power, they have a fast growing economy, and they need, they need new generation capacity. And that is what we see in a lot of emerging markets uh, South America, South Africa, some Asian countries. It's very clear that they are looking at having a clean choice when they have to install new capacity. Then you have countries like Australia, you have the EU, where there is enough generation capacity 
and people are saying, why don't we just stick to what we have? Why should we implement new uh, type of, of, of generation capacity? Uh, but that is, of course, also needed to make that transformation as you have to implement new capacity when you have to make infrastructure investments. So, so the key question is, if you have these incentives, you can faster move down to, let's say, more wind or more solar uh, in that area. And then you have to remember that energy business is not about the price at the pump tomorrow. It's about your price expectations for the next 20 years. So the really interesting thing is, where do you think the prices of gas are going to go in Australia over the next 20 years? And if you look at wind from a lot of utilities point of view, it's a part of a hedging strategy. You know what your turbines cost out front. You can make a long-term service agreement. And then if you feel pretty comfortable how the wind's going to blow, then you know for sure what that price of electricity is going to be. Whereas if you're looking at the gas, I think people have been wrong-footed a number of times where they thought it was going to go higher, it went lower, they thought it was going to go lower, then went higher. And that is some of the things that you can mitigate through wind. So nobody's going to have 100% wind, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I think you see a lot of utilities saying, well, it's a good idea to have 20, 30% of our portfolio on wind. And I have to say a lot of the CFOs in the energy company likes us because they can easily go to the board and say, the cost of wind is this, and I guarantee you it's going to be like that for many years to come. To get back to something that Bob asked a moment ago, yeah. the cost of wind versus solar PV versus gas, can you run us through the basics of that? It depends on, you know, um, it's, it's not to be awkward, but these questions are much more complicated. So I wish I could just say it's like that. Just first example, on an annualized basis, the fossil fuel industry in the world gets subsidies in excess of $500 billion. So to answer your question, is it with or without the $500 billion that the fossil fuel industry gets? That, I think, is an important... What do you mean by subsidies? Well, what, what sort of subsidies are we talking about? We, you talk about the number of governments that are paying uh, you producers. Uh, since 1923 in the U.S., it has been embedded in the tax code that monies are going from the U.S. Uh, taxpayer to support the oil and gas industry. It's a fact. So, so, so this just so these are the kind of support schemes. So everybody keeps saying, is wind com or is renewables uh, on par with, with fossil fuel? My only point is to say we always talk about subsidies on on renewables, but we never talk about the five hundred billion dollars a year that the fossil fuel industry is getting, and that's a fact uh, from from the IEA, International Energy Agency, and so on. So coming back to your question, there was a study out, and since we're in Australia today, let's focus on that. There was a study out by Bloomberg New Energy Finance here in the early part of the year where they went out and said, well, if you look at the cost of energy for Australia, uh, then wind will be cheaper than new installed gas or coal-fired power plants. Of course, if you have a depreciated coal-fired power plant, that's a different story. But if you want to install new generation capacity, then uh, wind is, is, is a good choice. And you have to remember one thing, that in Australia, you are blessed with, and I have to say as a wind guy, you are blessed with phenomenal wind resources. I think everybody in Australia knows that you have fantastic uh, coal uh, opportunities, and that's, I think everybody knows that. But not that many people in Australia actually know that if they looked at the wind map that we tend to do in our industry, and we look at Australia, we go like, wow, this is a fantastic wind opportunity. The issue that everyone always raises in relation to wind and solar, for that matter, is what happens when the wind doesn't blow. Uh, I guarantee you they're not going to turn around. Is there any, um, is there, is there, is there anything under development which would, would um, allow storage Absolutely. I think first, um, there, there are some... Now, you have in Australia a few percentage of your total energy mix being supported by wind. And in Denmark, where I come from, it's 28%. The Danish government has decided by 2020, we're going to go to 50%. That's just seven years away. And by 2050, the Danish government has also decided that we're going to run 100% of renewables which is going to be a combination of wind and biomass. The point here is that wind is a base load for Denmark. And obviously we also have days where the wind doesn't blow and we need backup for that. Gas is, uh, is, is there a, a, a good backup fuel? But again, when we look at something as exciting as the energy, we all, it's like, you know, we cannot just say the technology development is here today and it's going to be like this for the next 20 years. The only thing we know, that's not for sure. Uh, if we look at the mobile phone 20 years back and look at where it is today, look what has happened. The same happens in our sector. And a lot of work is being done at the moment in terms of storage and finding uh, batteries, uh, finding new ways of how you can store the power. 
And if that happened in the wind sector, it would be like the iPad uh, of the PC industry because that would change the whole thing. So the, the, the most risky thing you can do, I think, in any business is to say, we are here today, disregard technology development and say that we're going to be here in 10 years from now. The only thing we know is that that is not going to happen. But you can't predict what is going to happen, can you? You can at least come with some bets. Uh, and and if, if, I look at, if I look at the amount of investment that are going into finding new solutions on this area, because for a lot of countries that would be a game changer. It will also mean that you will reduce your dependency on other countries. It will mean that you could break the, a very important price barrier uh, for renewables. So a lot of work is going to go into that. If you just look at the amount of work that is going in in electrical cars and battery facilities, there are, of course, a lot of spin-off work in the R&D area that we are engaged in. And I cannot tell you when somebody has cracked the code of storage. But it's just clear when you look at how many people are pushing down there, I'm sure sooner or later somebody is going to find, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the solution to this. So my point is just when all the cost we have today is with the disadvantages of wind uh, not being able to store it. But if you then just dream, you know, as Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. Uh, so if you can try to think about, imagine if we could do that, what would that mean? Is China trying to wipe you and GE off the map? No. By, by slashing the cost of, of the wind installations? No. They've certainly cut the price. Yep. Um, um, but now, okay. So, first and foremost, Vestas has uh, six factories in China. We have a 100% Chinese footprint. So, if what you're saying should be correct, we can produce everything in China at Chinese cost. How much lower is that than other prices? Now, what we do weighs 250 tons a piece. So this is not like t-shirts and sneakers that you can just uh, mass produce stuff in a container ship around the world. If you look at the total cost of what we're doing, then actually we produce in Southern Europe, we produce in the US, we produce in China. And today you cannot move a wind turbine from China to Europe cheaper than you can produce it in Southern Europe. You cannot move it from China to the US cheaper than you can produce it in the US. So if our Chinese competitors want to take on Vestas, they also have to build up the manufacturing footprint in Europe or the United States. Or in Kyrgyz. Pardon? Or in Kyrgyz. Could also be. So my point here just is that there is this notion that because we for the last 20 years have seen that you mass produce something in Asia, ship it around the world, we have to remember that the business economics are changing. The cost of production in China uh, has gone up, cost of labor is going up, cost in Europe is going down, cost in the US has gone dramatically down. And therefore the, you know, copy-paste like produce in Asia, ship around the world, it is not the same for all industries and it's definitely not the same for our industry. So I'm being outdated, say three or four years ago, that was really on hmm. with our cutting the price. To, to be frank, we were not, we were not certain when, uh, when we globalized our footprint whether or not it was going to go like that. But, uh, but when we look at the, the cost today, then uh, we can for sure produce very competitively in China and use it in Asia, but you can't just, you know, like you do in other industry, ship it around, around the world. I'm sure you're acutely aware that there's been a, a debate going on in Australia about the 20% by 2020 renewable energy right. target, which is expressed as a percentage. Um, however, the renewable commitments, I think it's 41,000 gigawatt hours, um, and that, that looks like being 26 or 27 percent rather than 20 percent by 2015. Uh, I, I'm sure you've got a view about whether the target should be adjusted so that it is a genuine 20 percent. The first thing I would say is I cannot recall any country that has lowered their uh, uh, ambitions, even in the middle of the, of the financial crisis, of what percentage uh, of their uh, energy should come from, let's say, from renewables. So my first thing is to say, in our sector, and if people watching this uh, program will uh, forget everything else I've said, I will at least say one thing I do hope to remember is that for this industry, it's all about regulatory certainty. So for the Australian market to have a bipartisan agreement on where you want to go on energy policies, is this what going to release the investment to grow this business? And as far as I have heard, and I'm not the expert on everything here, but 
there seems to be a fairly good bipartisan support on the 2020 uh, targets. And obviously, there can always be discussions about how would that play out in terms of the energy mix and so forth and so on. And, and, and let's see how that goes. But the key issue really is to make sure that the energy policies in Australia is something that on a bipartisan level gives long-term business certainty for the investors. Because as I hear it here, it's not due to a lack of capital. There's a lot of capital that is ready to invest in big infrastructure projects in, in Australia. What seems to be holding certain things back is uh, some planning issues, some, some uh, uh, getting things approved or, or maybe having certainty about how to do the investment. The Coalition has said that they're going to have a, rev a review of the RET in 2014. The gas um, producers, not surprisingly, are, are saying that allowing the overshoot that's occurring to continue uh, means high costs for consumers. Uh, again, I, I imagine you've got a response to that too. Yeah, but I would say um, if you look at it, remember today wind is about 3%. I think that what is most important for any government, including an Australian government, is to make sure that the industry has predictable energy prices going forward. And there's no way better to hedge an energy price than on wind because once you, you know what the installation cost is and you then know for sure what the running cost is going to be the next 20 years. My view would be, if you go to 20%, you will still have a fairly good portfolio spread. You would have 20% of renewables where the prices are given and you will still actually have a bet on 80%, which is actually could be subject to fluctuations. So at least you could guarantee to the Australian people, if you go to 20%, we have now hedged 20% of our energy cost and we don't need to be concerned because if you look at some of the costs going forward, as far as I understand, there are huge discussions in Australia, will the gas prices go this much up, this much up? And then my answer is, well, if you do the 20%, you already made a pretty good bet. Well, the, um, it, but it's interesting because the, the discussion about renewable energy targets has always been in the context of emissions reduction, not in the context of hedge, of pricing mm. yeah. hedges. So are you trying to change the conversation away from emissions reduction towards pricing because, you know, the, the emission reductions uh, uh, debate is really kind of over. Is that what, you, is that what you're doing? You know, I will, uh, since this is on tape, uh, I will, uh, uh, you can go back five, ten, uh, five, um, five years from now and look at uh, whether I said it was right or wrong. But I'll, let me come with a prediction and then we can discuss in five years from now whether it was right or wrong. Um, I think it's very clear that uh, the world is going to run out of everything. And that means that the pressure on commodities uh, is going to be very, very high. And uh, we're going to be another 2 billion people on the planet over the next 20, 25 years. And those things are very important to remember and not just what we are discussing in today's world, namely exactly what's happening tomorrow. We keep forgetting about talking about the day after tomorrow. And we are going to have, uh, I think, anybody, when you talk about the challenges that you are referring to on the climate uh, and the emissions, uh, it's a given that we are under significant pressure. It just seems that we cannot at this moment comprehend all these issues because we are so embedded with banking and, and, and other stuff going on. But I'm sure that in five years from now, and this is my bet, that we're going to have discussions like we have in the banking industry. How come that we didn't act on the information we had on the table? How come that we just, well, we were so busy and so fast and so on. When you have a job like I do, then you have the luxury of getting a lot of information from the UN, from the International Energy Agency, from the World Bank and so fast and so on. And I think it's very, very clear that we are going to see a lot of challenges on the emission schemes and the emission challenges. But even so, if we just then forget that for a moment and just look at what is it that we're actually then doing on the other sector, we are actually creating some very interesting new opportunities on the energy side that we need. And when people are saying, well, if we don't do wind, what should we do instead? Should we go and build uh, nuclear? Uh, should we go and build coal? So what are the real options on the table for doing this going forward? And here I think that wind has this fantastic opportunity that on one hand, it keeps on reducing the cost of energy and has done so over the last 20, 25 years. And the only thing I will guarantee is that we will keep on reducing the cost of energy from wind going forward. But it's all about gas, isn't it? But It's all about gas. Well, I'm not saying that... There's, the so, much, there's so much gas. Yeah, uh, there is. But, but we have now. to remember that wind is only 3%. And 
when prices are going to come up again, because they are, because we are all going to draw on the same resources. We have to make a transformation on how we consume, both through efficiency gains, but also through the sources we explore. And to be very frank, I think it's very interesting that even though the wind sector has been very, very challenged at the moment, nobody has left the sector. Everybody's staying in there. That, of course, for us is a little challenge at the moment because it would be nice if somebody left. However, it also reinsures us that even some of the largest industrial companies in the world are saying this is a good place to be because it's going to be very interesting in the next years to come. And Australia has, and this is actually what should not be forgotten, you have fantastic wind resources, and that is not bad when you're going to see gas prices being much higher in a few years from now. But, but let me challenge that. Sure. I'll give you a different scenario. Yeah. That, that in the US, um, the shale gas revolution will be so huge that, 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 that the gas price won't rise above $4, it may, may go lower. Uh, the enormity of, of gas that is being discovered in Russia means that Europe's going to be flooded with gas. Um, um, China is now uh, looking as though it might discover large amounts of gas. And the question of it running out, uh, the Middle East has is, is, got enormous reserves of gas. We're not going to run out of gas for 100, maybe 200 years. Mm. And, 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 we, and, and, and so you're going to have to compete with low-cost gas for the next 100 years. Um, and, and it's not a question of running out in five years or six years or 10 years, it's 100 years. Yes. Let me just say two things, though. First, uh, if you talk about gas, gas has uh, the, let's say, this very positive uh, characteristic that it is emitting a lot less CO2 than coal, but it is still emitting CO2. That's one challenge. Secondly, I think that gas and the dependency on gas is something that any government would think twice about that you are dependent on one fuel only. I think most would like to make sure that you have a variety to bank on. And I'm not saying it's going to be wind and everything else is going to be gone. I'm saying we're going to need to make sure that this energy transformation takes place is done on dual on various tracks. And there those areas like Australia, it is we have to remember that like in some places you've got gas, you've got some places where you've got fantastic wind. And what I'm saying is that in Australia, you got fantastic wind resources. And if everybody's going to draw on the gas, you also have to remember that you have to transport it. And gas doesn't transport that easily uh, in terms of the losses that you actually have. So when you look at it today, if you take the shale gas in the U.S., it costs about 3 to $4 in the U.S. And land cost in Asia is about 12 13 I can tell you 12 13 wind is by far more competitive. So we just have to remember that a lot of infrastructure investment has to go in there in order to exploit the gas as well. So you're saying that, that uh, you can't, it's much more difficult to compete with gas in an area, but if you have to make it into LNG and transport it, then you're, you're in the game. Yeah, which, it's, that's it's one a, of our big industries. I mean, if, if, I look at the, if I look at the world today, I see a world where you pay this much for gas in the US, you pay for this in Europe, and you pay for this in Asia. And in, uh, not so long ago, gas was sort of, you know, uh, more on an equalized level. Now it's very much fragmented what the price, uh, gas prices are. The only thing is, what's going to happen then in between is that gas prices have seemed to be fluctuating a lot. And what I'm just saying is, from a government's point of view, that have to make sure that energy security is in place, it would probably be a good idea not to put all the money on one horse. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much, Didler. You're welcome. Yeah.